blood, what you do here? Oh, sing out that song, there is wonder working power. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Who would you be free from your passion and pride? There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary side. There is wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus? You do service for Jesus, your King. There is power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There is wonderful power in everyone sing the chorus. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. And it seems like our theme song for this particular meeting has been marching to Zion. Hymn number 222, sorry, 422. Let's all stand to sing this song, mighty song of the church. Come we that love the Lord and let our joy be known. Joined in a song with sweet accord. Joined in a song with sweet accord. Let us surround the throne and thus surround the throne. Oh, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those ring to sing who never knew a God but children of the heavenly king but children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad may speak their joy everyone sing the chorus oh we marching to Zion Beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city. The hills of Zion ring, the hills of Zion yield a thousand. Oh, before we reach, reach the heaven. Oh, before we reach. Reach the heavenly fields, the walk, the golden street, the walk, the golden street. Oh, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful.
beautiful Zion, we're marching up way to heaven, we that beautiful city of God. Then let our souls abound and every tear be, oh, we're marching through. Emmanuel's ground, we're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fear a world's on high, to fear a world's. Oh, we are marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching. That beautiful city of God. Oh, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion. That beautiful city of God. Praise the Lord. Remain standing. Praise the Lord. Let us first acknowledge the presence of our most important guests here tonight. Let us acknowledge the presence of Yahweh, our God. He invited us to be here with him in his presence. Let us acknowledge the presence of the Almighty God. Let us let us acknowledge the presence of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world who promises to be with us wherever we are. Let us acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit who is supremely qualified to move upon our hearts. And then we can acknowledge those of us who are here tonight. Amen. Welcome you from various parts of the world here tonight. We are blessed to come in the presence of the Almighty God. And before I say anything about those of us who are on the platform here, to me it's so incredibly important that we feel ready in our hearts to be in the presence of the Almighty God. And so I'm going to ask us for the next two minutes to bow our heads and close our eyes in complete quietness. If you have a cell phone that's going to disturb, please turn it off. And let us bow our heads in complete quietness and talk to God and ask Him to make our hearts ready to receive the grace and blessings that He wants to give to us tonight. Let's bow our heads quietly.
our Father and our God. Great Yahweh that you are, Elohim and creator of this universe. We do not invite you tonight because you're already here. We do not even invoke you because you are the one that have already sustained us. Father, tonight we do not ask you to fill our cups because our cups have already been filled. We do not ask you to let them overflow because they are overflowing with your bountiful blessings. Tonight, Father, we ask simply that once again divinity would touch dust, that divinity would teach dust, and that divinity would transform dust. Make us into your image. Do to us what you want so you can do through us what you will. Speak through your manservant tonight on this last evening service of the 29th Evangelism Council so that indeed we may leave this place changed. These things and the unspoken things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Brother Alwyn Johnson will represent us in speaking to the Lord on our behalf with the song, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. The gentleman who offered prayer for us is Pastor Sylvester. He passes in Mephia Seventh-day Adventist Church, California, Stockton, California. And we do praise God for his intercession on our behalf tonight. Pastor Roscoe Shields is one of our recent graduates from Oakwood University. And so we're proud to have him on the platform here. And he is pastoring in Columbus, Mississippi. We also have with us on the platform Sister Ruby Perry, who for the last 25 years has been a Bible worker in North Carolina, Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina. And so we, may I just put it this way, I've been so blessed with my mother's prayers. And uh, one of the dear sisters who was standing with Sister Ruby when I spoke with her, Sister Hadley, she said she remembers so much her mother's prayer when she was growing up. I love to hear mothers pray. And so she will do a benediction tonight, Sister Ruby. We are privileged to have also with us, I think everyone knows John. And he will offer for us the, the song of meditation uh, before Pastor Wright would speak. So at this time, we'll have Brother Alan Johnson.
in my heart in my heart Lord I want to be more holy in my heart in my heart in my heart Lord I want to be more holy in my heart Lord I want to be like Jesus in my heart in my heart Lord I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to be more holy. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. Our scripture reading for the evening is found in the book of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Thou prepare the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Sometimes we don't see how they could Struggles that break our hearts in two Sometimes binds us to the truth Our Father knows what's best for us for His way is not our own So when your pathway grows dim And you just can't see Him Remember you're never alone God is too wise 
to be mistaken and God is much too good to be unkind so when you don't understand and when you don't see his plan and you can't trace his hand trust his heart he sees the master plan and he holds your future in his hand so don't live as those who have no hope all our hope is found in him for we see the presence clearly but he sees the first and the last and like a tapestry, he's weaving you and me to one day be just like him. For God is too wise to be mistaken. Amen. And God is too good to be unkind so when you don't understand and when you don't see his plan and you can't trace his hand trust his heart for he alone is faithful and true and he alone knows what is best God is too wise to be mistaken Yes, our God is much too good to be unkind So when you don't understand And when you don't see His plan And you can't trace His hand Trust His heart When you don't understand and when you don't see God's plan and when you can't trace his hand just trust his heart just trust God That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes. Brothers and sisters, my listening and being touched with the preaching of Elder Henry Wright says that he has been a witness. He has seen and he has heard who is the word of life. Intellectually, scholarly, Experientially, Elder Wright is eminently qualified to preach to us tonight. Amen. But that's not the reason he's here. He has to tell us why the Lord has sent him here tonight to give us a word. 
Amen. God bless you all. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, it's pitiful. <laughs> I said good evening. good evening. It's been a good meeting, hasn't it been? And I must join with my other fellow colleagues and speakers and express to you, uh, to Dr. Warren and to the committee for the opportunity of sharing in this, in this meeting. I was reflecting, and I do recall that the first year that we had this meeting, I was at that time serving as the pastoral administrative professor and so had a chance to present at the very first one of these conventions. Since that time, the brethren have been kind enough to invite me back time after time. I've often avoided it because of this late night session. But it's all right. Holy Ghost stays up all night long. And so we are happy to be here. And then, of course, in the context of this meeting and the context of the times in which we are living, we are just absolutely mesmerized by the kind of events that we now witness and experience that allow us to preach with so much fervor. I rise up on Sunday and I can't wait till Sabbath. The horse is ready to run. Come on, somebody. Because God keeps pouring himself out and renewing the old preaching material. Come on, somebody. And you find yourself on Sabbath morning all tingly down inside. Huh? And you just want them to get the pastoral prayer and the tithe and all that gump out of the way so you can preach. <laughs> and then you let the Negro get up on Tuesday night and preach. Don't have to wait till Sabbath. Lord, help us. Let's pray. I'm in your hands, Lord. Amen. First Corinthians 10 and verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but those that are common to man, but God is faithful. I say God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will in the midst of the temptation make a way of escape so you can bear it? Can I get a witness tonight? Pastors like to trade 
war stories. Workers like to trade war stories. You know, the church board meeting, Pastor, where the antagonists against your program were all lined up to sink your ship even before you got your new ideas launched. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And then you tell as you stand in the circle of preachers how the Lord moved and your detractors were left speechless as the board sided with you. Or maybe your favorite war story is how the ugly rumors were circulating about you, your ministry, your character, your life, and you just held your peace. Watched as the wagging tongues about you were humbled. Yes, silence as the real facts came to light. That's a good war story. And then someone else in the gathering of preachers will tell the one where the evangelistic crusade was not drawing people. And you looked like it would have no meaningful production, but you and your team, no, 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 make it more dramatic. You and your pregnant wife. <laughs> went out and knocked on doors. And the crowd began to grow and, 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 and where you feared you would baptize, no one you baptized, 30, probably 13, but it sounds like 30. <laughs> and then someone says, but wait, let me tell you about the conference president who just didn't seem to like me, wouldn't give me a break. But you just bent your back. We talk more stories now. You just bent your back and worked hard anyhow and prevailed and, and the president now is long gone. You're pastoring one of the largest churches in the conference. War story. War stories cover small churches to small people. War stories because you never get invited to the camp meeting to preach, and even though you work hard on your sermons, war stories that involve children who are not in church and bills that have mounted up while you're trying to keep those kids in church school on a pastor's salary. Children killed and spouses afflicted and on and on. War stories. I have one I like, Murray. You remember I started down in Greenville, Mississippi. Somebody pray for the pastor. It was a sign to a little church and the elder of the church, the first elder of the church, y'all pray for me now, because this thing still stirs me up. I've been in the work 44 years. This was my first district, and I've gone away from my first workers' meeting, and, and the first elder, without a vote of the board or anybody, even the angels did not commission him, <laughs> knocked a hole in the wall of the church right where his wife sits and put an air conditioner in that wall of my church, God's church, so his wife would be cool. War stories. Now, brother, I've not always been a preacher. And I came back. Oh, John and his wife over there in Greenwood, I needed you, John. I couldn't find you that night came back and saw this hole in this air conditioner and I went to see the elder. Now, brethren, you ought not go see the elder without the Lord. Watch me now. And I stood there toe-to-toe -to -toe with this man, old enough to be my grandfather, howling and hollering and shouting at him. And he at me in front of his wife, embarrassed, reduced, ministry, compromised left that house, went home to the, to the little, to the little uh, parsonage where, where Elder Dudley and the brethren had put me in 1727 Spruce Street, right next to the church, and knelt down and prayed and wept 
got on the phone, called my father, said, I'm coming home. I'm not cut out for this. Dad said, you are home. That's my favorite war story. Stay with me now. We just land the groundwork. Usually when I'm in these conversations where the war stories are flying around, I get a little quiet after a while. Gerald Pinnock, I begin to watch those who are quiet, who don't say anything. Now it could be that they're just quiet by nature or it may be that they're an intern in the midst and they don't really have any scars on their soul yet so they have nothing to say. They don't have any anecdotes, all they have is apprehension. <laughs> But then there's another set of quiet people in the war, stor uh, war storytelling circle. Maybe they used to be talkers, but now they stand quiet. You see, they're still hurting. Stay with me, pastor. Stay with me, worker. The pain is still too close. And you see, when that worker went before the church board and the antagonist went after him, uh, the Lord did not come through it seemed and he got his head handed to him on a platter. The quiet story, the quiet person in that war storing, tell telling story circle, uh, there's a tear in his eye because when the ugly rumors about him begin to circle, they turned out to be true. And that quiet person's evangelistic crusade, Murphy, it did not produce anything knocked on doors and when they asked their pregnant wife to go out and knock on the doors with them she looked at him as if he needed a place to go that was hot permanently <laughs> and that conference president stay with me is still there and they still have a small place and it appears that their prayers bounce off the ceiling they do not get an answer from the Lord and and so the war stories for them leave them breathless and nervous and laughing hollowly They don't have happy endings. They are in debt and, 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 and they don't get invited anywhere to preach and, and their kids are not just out of church, they're, they're on dope and they're pregnant out of wedlock and their marriage is a facade and they come to evangelism council and fake their way through, smiling, happily, laughing, pretensively, but down inside, dying because they've not learned that their ministry is not just God's call to save others, their ministry is God's call to save them. And so you've come here wondering, faking it one more year, hoping that nobody knows that your life is about to fall apart. I stood here last year not in this spot, but sitting right over there, quaking inside, knowing there could be cancer in my body and found out six days after I left here, there was cancer in my body. And, and you ask yourself, having preached and taught for 41 years, how in the world could something like that happen to me? But you see, you gotta remember, it's not about how many years, it's about the fact that God is not done working on you yet and he has not given you permission to tell him how long he shall work as long as there's breath in your body. He will chisel on you till he gets you where he wants you to be. And if you cannot accept that process, then find yourself a day job. Because this job is a day job and a night job and an every hour job. Come on, somebody. I was asked to preach on a doctrine tonight. I am. The doctrine of ministry. You see, you have to come to believe in what you do and what it's about. And we have no time for monkeying around, brothers and sisters. There's a world out there waiting and they need Seventh-day Adventist preachers who know how to preach this message. 
who've taken all the old yellow notes and thrown them away. They have the T.D. Jake sermons in a file somewhere, and the file is file 13. And they're studying for themselves and finding God's truth afresh for themselves because nobody has got stuff to preach like we can preach. So we don't need to copy anybody. Just reach down inside of that Bible, grab the spirit of prophecy, and preach the word. We don't have any time to mimic somebody, try to sound like somebody. If the Lord wanted everybody to sound like Walter Pearson and C.D. Brooks and Bradford, he'd have kept them alive for 2,000 years. No, he chose your carcass, your voice, your mind, your life. Preach. Don't apologize. Preach. I don't need to sound like anybody, just sound like me. Saved by grace, bought by the blood, washed in the fountain, just Henry Wright. Saved by Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost. I don't care how I sound, as long as I have the joyful sound that Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Tell the world, Jesus saved. to read a text now. It's good homiletics to read a text in your sermon. Matthew 10 sets the tone. Now, I'm not going to preach a short sermon this evening. So, you got plans? Go ahead. I'll be here till I'm finished. Matthew 10. Now, Elaine, this is a very interesting text for preachers and workers. Listen. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples. Now watch this, John. He gave them power. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, Andrew, his brother James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent forth. Something wrong with this text. First of all, there's a terrorist in here named Simon the Canaanite. There's two gangbangers, James and John, the sons of thunder. There's a white collar crook called Matthew the publican. And there's a fella named Thomas who don't believe in his own mama. And then there is a side winding crook named Judas. Now something's beginning to grow in my mind. Jesus calls us to ministry because of what he knows about us. So it wasn't your voice, wasn't your character, wasn't your A's at Oakwood or your C's. His call was because he knew Ministry was the only way to save your soul. Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. You need to soak that thing in. And then to show you 
the majestic, imaginative optimism of Jesus, he gives to the gangbangers, he gives to the white collar crook, he gives to the terrorists power. My Bible's almost so hot now I can't hold it. He gave them power. He gave them power, Merv, before, before the issues were settled. He gave them power while they were still watching pornography. He gave them power while they were still looking too long in the wrong direction. Don't get quiet, keep saying amen. He gave them power when they still weren't convicted on tithe paying. He gave them power, not just because he wanted to use them to save others. He gave them power, extra power, because crooked folks like that need a whole lot of power to be saved by Jesus. Now I got a whole different view of my ministry. I thought he called me because I was somebody. Now I know he called me because I'm a nobody. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. So stop your strutting, acting like you're somebody. Stop walking around like you're a brand new peacock who's been bought by the Lord. Understand that your call to ministry is an announcement that you got serious issues. I'm going to take this hard-headed, stubborn, unconverted, needs-to-be-saved person and work with them, and I'm going to do it by putting them in board meetings and making them visit people and put them in tents on a corner. Come on, somebody. I'm going to work them over until they know ain't nobody but God that could save somebody like me. Now I do not preach with pride, I preach with humility. I'm going to call Henry Wright, his lungs ain't worth a dime. I'm going to call Henry Wright and I'm going to let him have cancer somewhere down the line. I'm going to call Henry Wright, I'm going to put him in strange places with strange people. You do know that some of our members are crazy. Now, if you're a layman tonight, don't be offended. Don't be offended. Crazy man, pastoring crazy people. <laughs> These situations that God puts us in are designed to carve out and prune and make us everything God wants us to be. He gave Judas power over unclean spirits. Now, man, what a mighty God we serve. And so, Thompson, we don't have to walk around like we are somebody and we all ready to be caught up. See, I decided a long time as I began to study myself as a pastor, I, a long time ago, I used to hear Elder Ward say, he was working on the 140, he wanted to be in the 144,000. And I said, you know, that's good. That's excellent. Small number though. <laughs> and then I heard, I heard a pre preacher say once, I wish I was amongst the 24 elders. That's an even smaller number. And I, I got very depressed. And then I kept reading. Found in there says a number which no man can number. I said, I think I can make that one. Come on, somebody. You see, you got deacons more righteous than you. You got deaconess more faithful than you. You got church members that can out pray you. Come on. You got Sabbath school teachers that know more Bible than you. It ain't about you being somebody. It's about God deciding, I found him and I found her and the only way I can save them is lay this burden on their life. Yes. 
the um, the um, the Amplified Bible takes my key text and uh, oh that was not good takes my key text <laughs> and here's that sounds Amplified Bible now when you're old like me you can pick up your notes and read them <laughs> don't have to act like I got all this stuff in my head of course I don't <laughs> for no temptation no trial regarded as enticing to sin no matter how it comes or where it leads has overtaken you and laid hold on you that is not common to man that is no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance and that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience such as man can bear but God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature and he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure but with the temptation he will always also provide the way out the means of escape to a landing place that you may be capable and strong and powerfully patient to bear up under it. Paul is the author of the text. Paul was a worker. Paul understood the doctrine of ministry. The doctrine of ministry is more than the minister's acts under the Holy Spirit as a living vessel for the salvation of a dying planet as some, something else. Ministry is God's means to save the minister. I'm going to keep saying that without apology. And that's why Paul cried out with justifiable fear but I keep under my body bring it under subjection see folk we we have to minister out of this and some of us have inherited stuff don't sit there pious we've inherited stuff and 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 and, and even while we're trying to pastor we wrestle with that stuff we have the temper of Moses come on and the desires of David come on come on come on come on come on uh, we, 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 we have this stuff in us and and the folks are calling us pastor and 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 an elder and all this kind of stuff but 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 Paul understood he said listen I, I, I gotta keep this under subjection lest having preached to others I myself should be a castaway now that ought to that ought to scare you that ought to drive you to your knees every day. How dare you walk outside your house every morning and not bend your knees and pray, worker? How dare you assume that because you've got a title in front of your name that you're now immune to falling in some lane? How dare you not recognize that you need the Lord more than the people you pastor? Because you are pastor. But I became a conference president. I prayed twice as much. Because I never wanted that thing to go to my head. Grown men walk around calling you chief. <laughs> chief of what? <laughs> a field that ain't got enough money to pay its bills? Chief. And you see, the devil takes, see, see, he, see a, a brother and I can talk and sister is straight because I've worked on every level of the church. I've done it all. So don't come to me about what you are, what you've attained. I've been there. Ain't nothing to it. Just be saved. I've been on the union level, I've traveled all around, you know, the credit card and all that kind of stuff in the American Express and, you know, brother and paying all the bills and so forth. That, that's all fine. That's all fine. Lots of folks going to hell living just like that. I've never sought any position in this church. Just work. Just work. 
Because if the Lord wants you to have it, he'll provide it. And if you get it without him, you're going to stumble and fall. See, the reason why you're in a little church isn't because you're just starting out. You're in a little church because Jesus has got some things he can only do for you in a little church. The reason why he only baptized two people because he couldn't trust you with 20. Let him do his work on you. And when he provides, enjoy it. If he doesn't, enjoy it. Paul's life was full of trials. His war stories, beatings, imprisonments, riots, five times the 40 lashes minus one, three times beaten with rod, stone once, three times shipwrecked at night in the open sea, and besides all this, danger from bandits and from his own countrymen, countrymen and then he was mistreated by his own brethren. See, some of you are still bitter because the brothers didn't stand by you. And you got so caught up in the brothers standing by you, you forgot that Jesus stands for you. And yet in spite of all these things Paul went through, Paul developed some axioms. What word did I say? Talk to me, what word did I say? He said, yet I'm not ashamed. Because I know in whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he's able to guard that which I've entrusted to him for that day. Then he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you hear him? Then he said, for I am now ready to be offered up and the time of my departure is at hand. Do you see it? First, I know who. And since I know who, I can do all things. And since I know who and I can do all things, I'm ready. Yes, sir. Oh, shoot. You have to, listen, Paul, in spite of what he went through, came to the point where there were things upon which he's unmovable. Now let me ask you a question, pastor. Let me ask you a question, worker. Let me ask you a question. Have you come to the point of your life in this church when you've got solid axioms that nobody can move you from? Do you really believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath? Don't say amen too quick. Do you really believe that God's law is, is immutable and cannot be changed? Do you believe that 10% of your tithe that you live off of ought to be tithed back to the church? It's getting quiet in this place. Do you believe? Do you believe in the system of this church? So I get a little wary of folk running around talking about they need to change how the church operates and you ain't made no contribution to the church yet. Get some scars on your soul, then come back and tell us how to run the church. We let ourselves get wrapped up in stuff that don't matter. What you've got to do is be a solid, unmovable believer. Because some things are going to happen in your life that are going to rock you. And you got to be sure that you cannot be so easily discouraged and bent. you got to make up your mind. If nobody comes to prayer meeting, you'll be there. If nobody studies, you'll study. If nobody returns tithe, you'll tithe. If nobody visits, you'll visit. you got to decide. I'm here to stay. I shall not be moved. We need workers full of faith and determination who believe in this church and all it stands for. We need pastors who are standing up in the pulpit on Sabbath preaching the pure doctrines of the church, preaching the book of Revelation, preaching the book of Daniel. We don't need all this societal stuff. Just preach the word in season, out of season. 
Go back to that text you preached before and milk it one more time. Find out there's something else there. And then walk up in the pulpit with confidence and with courage and preach your soul out. God will reward you. Stop lying and saying on Sabbath morning, the Spirit moved upon you Friday night. making excuses for dilatory pastoring. Visit the sick. Encourage the discouraged. Do the work of a pastor. Why is this 1 Corinthians 10, 13 so special? It says, first of all, there is no temptation taking you but those common to man. I like the earlier translation here that we read. It says the wrong desires of problems that come into your life are not anything new and different. See, in those war story circles, that text steps on your ego. See, one of the glories and dangers of war stories is feeling that nobody has experienced what you've experienced. It allows us to legitimately enlarge the problem to super proportions in our minds and in the minds of others. Ain't nobody been through this, man. Nobody had a board like that. Nobody had a beating like that. That's a lie. See, doing that allows you to prepare the way in the closet of your own fears for failure that is excusable. See, if nobody been through it before, then if you fail, you failed because you had this unique experience. And of course, if you succeed, then you really are something else. Because <laughs> you succeeded in an experience that nobody else had. What you forget is, God nor the devil is so impressed with you that they need to give you a special experience. We've not overcome the ordinary problems. Come on, somebody. So God doesn't need to come up with some special problem for you. In fact, the Bible says, for everything written in the past was written to teach us so that the encouragement of the, uh, of the scriptures, we might patiently hold on to our hope because these things come upon us upon whom they've come on before. So God doesn't bring you any special problems. I remember talking to an old Swedish Adventist pastor and he said this to me. I wish I could take credit for it, but he said it. If it's considered too egotistical to take all the credit, then it's also self-centered to take all the blame. Are you listening to me? So whatever dilemmas you face in your ministry, somebody's been there before you. Second, the text says, God will not put more on you than you can bear. Ah, don't say amen too quick. We always say amen to that, Steve. God never puts more on you can bear. That's right, child. Amen. Do you really believe that? See, usually if somebody's going through a rough time, it seems insensitive to say that to them. But the text says, but God is faithful. Now watch me, watch me. The focus of the trial isn't just you. God, see, the trial isn't just about you, it's about God. See, if the trial is more than you can bear, then God is not faithful. So if the trial is there, then God who is faithful has already measured it and decided that it's your size and lets it go forward. 
And if God is faithful, then when the trial comes, it is not a vote of con condemnation. If God is faithful, then the trial is a vote of confidence in you. Ha ah, ha, you didn't get that. If God lets it come, then God is saying, I believe they can handle it. Therefore, the small church and the rough conference president and the meeting that's given you all kinds of problems, God says, if I allow it, if I permit it, it's your side. And it's a vote of confidence that you can handle it. Otherwise, I would not permit it. So stop belly aching and go on and accept the vote of confidence and stand like a rock. Why do I preach with bad lungs? Because God is faithful. It means I lean on him more when I preach. Come on, somebody. God is faithful. He believes that if he let Henry Wright preach with bad lungs for 40 some years, that that vote of confidence would cause me to look toward him for every breath that I breathe. Are you listening to me? Now I want you to think about where you are, Pastor, what your situation is. Because God has given you a vote of confidence. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you this way. This, this, this thing is, this thing is so, so sweet and precious to me. Lord, help me find this thing. Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Lord Jesus, please, 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 please. Help me to find it. Help me, here it is, here it is. Oh, I tell you, it's fun getting old. <clears throat> You know why I was late coming here to preach? Couldn't find my glasses. And I wore them into the building. But God is faithful who will not say. Now listen, 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 listen. listen. Each one has his own battles to fight, his own Christian experience to gain. Independent in some respect from any other soul, and God has lessons for each to gain for himself that no other can gain for him. Our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. It's your size. He weighed it, Dr. Brown, before he gave it to you. So when he passes it on, receive it. Paul said, I count it all joy. He considers the circumstances and the strengths of the one who is to stand under the proving test of God. And he never permits the temptations to be greater than the capacity of resistance. You say, well, now, Pastor, but what about the dumb stuff I bring on myself? You don't think God knew he was going to be stupid one day? <laughs> so even the dumb stuff you did to bring something on yourself, God knew when you were going to do it, why you would do it, and Ellen White says, then he cushions it. He cushions that thing. So even your stupidity does not cause you to lose your soul. Somebody ought to shout tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Woo! Hallelujah. So the Bible is clear. 
Ellen White is clear. If God permits it, then God has weighed it. It's your size. And even if you did something dumb for it to happen, God has already seen the time you would do it. You know, there are folks in here tonight who are pastors and workers. You ought not be alive. Come on and tell God the truth. You ought to be messed up. Your minds ought to be blown up. Even that dumb stuff you did because God called you when you were a terrorist. God called you when you were a gangbanger. God called you when you were a white collar crime doer. God called you when you were a betrayer. And God knew exactly what it would take. God does not change his mind. He cannot make a mistake. He reached out in the gutter, brought you up, put his hand on you. You're his. Even when you're dumb, you're his. That doesn't mean that he approves of your stupidity. He just loves you. God does an amazing thing for sinners. One of the most amazing texts in the Bible, I'm, I'm getting near done. Now, just relax. See, a lot of you are going to go to the motel tonight, eat a sandwich late, <laughs> all that cheese and milk. <laughs> now, this is not in my notes. This is free. <laughs> you do know there are very few Seventh Adventist workers who live the health message. I was one of them. And that's why the Lord has cursed this church in the last days with cancer and all kinds of diseases. Because he said to God's people years ago in Exodus 15, 26, if you'll obey my commandments, none of these diseases will be upon you. There's nothing like sitting in a doctor's office like I did six days after I left here last year and hearing that C word, cancer, prostate cancer. Main cause, dairy products. Guess what? I don't even like the sight of milk anymore. is all free. It's not in the notes. You can't give me enough gratuity to pay for this morning. God wants a, listen to me, God wants a working staff in the last days that's so strong of mind and body in the pressures we must deal with. You know, the ministry will kill you. The ministry will kill, the ministry will kill you dead. You better treat your body like a vessel because I don't care what pressures you've been under. The worst days are ahead of us, but I plan by God's grace with my vegan self now to stand strong in the last days. It ain't easy. When you order that pizza, don't order it around me. My mouth still drools. Let me tell you what God does. Do what God does. Do what God does. He's an amazing God. See, I'm talking about now your dumb stuff that you do. See, I'm still on the dumb stuff. And some of you didn't believe that theology I put out there, so I'm going to show you what God does. Lord, have mercy. 1 Kings 9. And verse 4. I almost got to sit down and read this text because it's just too powerful. 
I talked about the dumb stuff, didn't I? Stuff you had no business doing, didn't I? How God cushions it. Didn't I say that? Didn't I say how the Lord saw it coming? And God, did I say that? 1 Kings 9, verse 4. Uh, This is God talking to Solomon. If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked. As David thy father walked. As Bathsheba chasing David thy father walked. As acting crazy in the house of the Ammonites, thy father did. In integrity of heart. Yeah. What? In integrity of heart and in uprightness. To do according to all that I've commanded. And will keep my statutes and my judgments. Who is this God? that sets up a lying, murdering, adulterating man as a standard of integrity and uprightness. Because when you do that dumb stuff and God cushions it and leads you through your mess, there's a transaction that takes place in glory. And it's so complete that the books in heaven get cleaned up. And so God does not talk about your past. All he sees is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the folks may still be talking and the board may still be voting and the conference committee may still be upset, but God has cleaned up your record and your foolishness disappears. And then God talks about you like you never said a mumbling word. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Solomon, do you want an example? Now Solomon grew up in his daddy's house. Solomon must have said, what? Who's he talking about? But he wanted Solomon to know who later would live with 1,000 women. He wanted Solomon to know, Lord have mercy, that the blood of Jesus cleanses me of all unrighteousness. And then in case we forgot, he had Ezekiel write down over there in the 20th chapter, hey, if the wicked who have done their wickedness will turn from their wickedness and turn to righteousness, then their sin shall not be mentioned to them anymore. I won't discuss it. I won't remember it. I won't hold on to it. I'll fix it because your ministry has been used to save you. Give God some glory. That's why I don't worry about the stuff that people hear about you, talk about, whisper about. You can discuss it all you want. Where it matters, it ain't being discussed. Well, uh, uh, didn't he? None of your business. But I heard none of your business. But I'm sure because I, none of your business. Because in the meantime, is the judgment taking place. Uh Uh-huh, and Joshua the high priest named Henry Wright is standing before the Lord and his clothes are dirty. And then he hears somebody say, take off his dirty clothes. Cover him with my righteousness. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's wrap it up now. Just wrap it up. And so the third thing in the text is that he will make a way of escape. 
Want me to spend some time on that? Brother wants to help me preach my sermon. That she may be able to bear it. Now, 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 you're probably looking for some magic formula, way of escape. I done told you already, God didn't dream up any special problems for you, nor does he have any special solutions for you. Tim, the ways of escape are what they've always been. Prayer. Talk to me. Prayer. Prayer. Bible study. Come on now. Worship. And Christian service. That's the four legs of a Christian life. And the reason why you were called into the ministry, whether it be the ministry of treasury, whether it be the ministry of teaching, or the ministry of preaching, or the ministry of evangelism, the reason why you were called to that is so God could move you to become a praying, Bible-studying, worshiping, and serving human being. But because you were so hard-headed, he couldn't trust you to be a layman. He had to bring you into the ministry. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. In the book of John, in the book of John, The 13th chapter. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Those same disciples that I started with, Roddy, good to see you, man. Those same disciples that I started with, the gangbanger, <laughs> the white-collar crime doer, the crook, the terrorists, it's now three years later. Preachers, workers, are hard to win. See, it's our nature. Most of us have big egos. That, that helps you preach. You're going to stand up in front, of, in front of a bunch of people and preach. You've got to have a little ego. You've got to feel like you've got something to say. That takes a lot of nerve. Because most folks ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> You're going to stand up in front of a bunch of people and have something to say. You have a little ego. It's all right. Holy ego. That's all right. <laughs> and then to deal with church folk, you got to have some backbone. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. Saints will mow you down to powder. And you got to have enough self something so that when you get mowed down you can still get up so preachers have natures that are hard to win so after three and a half years Jesus has made very little Jesus has made very little progress and yet it's a good sermon isn't it Yet, and yet, he has not changed his mind. In fact, if you go over to Luke 22, he says to them, I have desired, last supper, I have desired to eat this supper with you. Now he's talking to a guy who's got 30 pieces of silver under his belt sitting at the table. He's talking to another guy who's got a knife under his belt, which he's going to use in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, I desire to eat with you. You know, thank God that Christ is crazy about us. So after the supper, I mean, John, after the supper, they're talking. <laughs> then wash feet and everything, chapter 12 and 13. Got all holy communion, ordinance of humility, ordinance of humility. And, and Luke tells you that they're arguing at the table who shall be the greatest after the ordinance of humility. <laughs> Preachers, you can't beat us. You can't beat workers. We all, 
We never see ourselves quite like we are. Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Now, it's a, they're talking now, uh, Hank. They're talking, they've had the supper, they've washed feet. Ordinance of humility. You know, <laughs> a couple of them even brought the mama in to the communion service. <laughs> Lord, I want one boy on this side and other boy on that side. And of course, the Bible makes clear that the rest of the disciples were upset now. Negroes trying to line themselves up. Jews, I mean, Jews trying to line themselves up <laughs> for the top spots in the GC. <laughs> and then going to wash feet. <laughs> so it, it, this is a group. So, so, so verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Now, every now and then Jesus talks straight. Whether I go, thou canst not follow. <laughs> Thou canst not follow me afterwards. In other words, very nice. You ain't near ready to go nowhere. <laughs> Close to glory. You still got to pastor that little church. You still got to deal with that board. You need to do some more evangelistic campaigns. You need to stop eating wrong. <laughs> you ain't ready to go nowhere. And Peter's very pious. Whither thou goest. Jesus says, thou goest nowhere. <laughs> Peter still pious, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thee. Aren't we something? Jesus answered him, wilt thou? I'm just reading the Bible, y'all. Wilt thou? I mean, Jesus is almost in shock. He knows what kind of movies the brother's watching. He knows who the brother calls late at night. He knows how much time the brother spends babysitting his kids rather than doing ministry. Uh, wilt thou lay down thy life for me? Verily, verily. He better be glad Jesus was talking. See, very nice. Verily, verily. He better be glad it wasn't me. I say unto thee, the crock, the cock, shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, chapter 13 ends right there. There are no divisions in the Bible in the Greek. So there is no chapter 14. So the next words, Merv, are exactly to the person he's talking to. He just told Peter, you can't go, you're not ready, and you're so unready, you're going to deny me. The next words are, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Peter's going to deny you, but while he's denying me, I'm preparing a place for him. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah! 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 While he's denying my name, I'm getting this mansion ready. While the preacher's discouraged, I got his white robe already being mended. While the preacher's not praying, I've told the Father, he belongs to me. While you're down in the dumps, he's already preparing your place for you. And when he gets done, he says, when I'm done with you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
in a hill called Mount Calvary and I believe that whatever the cost and when time has surrendered and this old earth is no more I'll still cling to that old rugged cross I believe that this life with its great mystery Surely someday will come to an end. Oh, but faith will conquer all the darkness and death and will lead me at last to my. That the Christ who was slain on that cross has the power to change lives today. You know how I know? For He changed me completely. fourth year I wouldn't trade anything for this life Elaine that God has given me I've let him down big upon occasion he's always picked me back up I want to read something to you We're never called upon to make a real sacrifice for God. Many things that he asks us to yield to him. In doing this, we're just giving up that which hinders us heavenward. Even when called upon to surrender things in themselves that are good, we can be sure that God is working out something of a higher good. Yeah. In the future, life's mysteries that have annoyed us and disappointed us will be made plain. We shall see that our seemingly unanswered prayers and disappointed hopes have been among our greatest blessings. Therefore, we are to look to every duty, however humble, as sacred, because it is God's service. And our daily prayer should be, worker, 
Lord, just help me to do my best. Teach me how to do a better work. You see, folk, at 66 and 44 years of ministry, I think my best days are in front of me. You ain't seen nothing yet. Got a 1,200-member church, and I'm gearing them up for next year like I'm just getting started. Because God never stops blessing. Finally pray, help me to bring into my service the loving ministry of the Savior. How is it with you? Tomorrow the meeting will end. What's your war story? What did you bring? How is it with your marriage? How are your kids doing? Are they in the church? Are the members that you avoid, they intimidate you? You intimidate them? Are you bluffing your way through board meetings you never prepared for? You get up and preach and holler and stomp, saying very little because you didn't study. How is it with you, really? Because none of this really makes any difference, folk. On that great getting up morning, I'm not looking to go in as Pastor Dr. Henry Wright. I just want to go in as a sinner saved by grace. So I don't know your situation. But if you feel a need, why don't you come and press to the altar? Yeah, I think you're right, Steve. We ought to go to our knees. When we get down here, we ought to go to our knees. If you can't kneel, then just stand. She's playing just as I am. Remember Matthew 10. That's how he called them. He called the gangbangers. He called the betrayer. Harrington, 